A published biography of Nelson Rockefeller, which was a finalist in this year's National Book Awards. And what I thought I'd read tonight is uh, a little bit about him. Now, best-selling horror novelist Stephen King talks about censorship and the place of popular literature in the classroom. His remarks were delivered at a conference called Reading Stephen King, hosted by the University of Maine. Stephen King is author of over 20 novels, two of which are currently on several bestseller lists. Good evening. I think we'll try to get started. My name is Burton Hatlin. I'm currently serving as Interim Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities at the University of Maine. I'm here partly because I am temporarily a dean, and in this capacity, I would like to officially welcome you to our, our university. Please make yourselves at home on our campus, and I hope that you enjoy what promises to be a classic Maine fall weekend. But I'm here also for another reason, because Steve King was a student of mine at this university. Steve entered the University of Maine as a first year student 30 years ago, almost to the day. It would have been late September. Um, 1966. I don't know if the conference was planned in recognition of this anniversary, but there is certainly some serendipity here. It seems especially appropriate that I, as a member of the English department, should be welcoming Steve to a conference organized and sponsored by the College of Education. For, for Steve came here intending to become a high school English teacher. In the 60s and 1970s, such students sometimes came into the College of Arts and Sciences and sometimes into the College of Education, and Steve chose the second alternative. But both groups of students took most of their classes with the English department, while also taking a series of education courses, and then going on to student teaching. And that was the path that Steve followed. Steve's college years flowed up from time to time in his novels. He wrote Pet Cemetery during a year when he came back to teach in the English department in the late 1970s. And the novel begins with a scene in the Student Health Center in this campus. <coughs> a very um, grim scene, I might add. <laughs> A longtime colleague of mine in the English department, Jake Bennett, is the original of a character in The Dark Half. A pair of cops in misery, both of whom end up dead, are named for two people who chaired the English department around, <laughs> around the time that Steve taught here, Ulrich Wicks and Nancy McKnight. <laughs> On at least two occasions, Steve has borrowed my name and possibly some parts of my personality for characters. In the mist, a minor character named Michael Hatlin is active in local politics, as I have been. He is, as I recall, eaten by a giant spider. <laughs> <clears throat> and in Rita Hayworth in the Shawshank Redemption, Steve spliced my name with the name of Brooks Hamilton, a longtime journalism professor, to create a character named Brooks Hatlin, a longtime con who finds life outside the institution intolerable. <clears throat> Right. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and indeed, I have been part of the University of Maine for so long that it is now hard for me to imagine life outside this institution. <clears throat> Knowing Steve can sometimes be an uncomfortable experience for you. You sometimes sense that he sees things about you that you don't quite want to face. Also, one of Steve's more or less autobiographical characters, Bill Denbro of It, studies creative writing at the University of Maine, where he finds himself at loggerheads with a teacher contemptuous of his interest in popular culture. The unhappy experiences of, actually Steve told me this evening that this isn't based on anybody he met here. It was purely imaginary. The unhappy experiences of Bill Denbro, as well as Steve's inclination to associate the university with a prison and its faculty with obtuse cops, <laughs> may suggest that his experiences here weren't entirely pleasant. <clears throat> and indeed, this university or any other can make young people feel like beggars scrambling for the crumbs that fall from the faculty high table. But what I remember best about Steve's college years were the ways he made this place his own. I can still remember what it felt like to have Steve's, Steve's eyes watching you in a class. Here was, you felt, one student who could see through you in an instant if you tried to fake it. And how many teachers have never had to fake it at some point? Steve was a vivid and powerful presence on campus, not simply because of his his appearance, which was, as anyone who has seen the famous study, damn it, photograph can attest, vivid and dramatic, but also because of the force of his personality and intelligence. He acted in plays on this stage. 
He published a column in the student newspaper. He even taught a course while still an undergraduate, probably the only time that that has happened in the history of this university. He may have felt like an outsider, but others saw him as a man who knew how to make the university into the kind of place he needed it to be. I have many memories of Steve from that period, but I'll limit myself to one. In the spring of 1970, the faculty of the College of Arts and Sciences sat in this auditorium, the seats were in better shape in those days, and debated how to respond to the calls for a student strike in the wake of the Kent State shooting. And I remember Steve, perhaps as a representative of the student government, sitting on the lip of the stage, watching us. Then as now, I felt in those eyes a challenge to be straight with him and with myself, to be true to the principles on which the university claims to ground itself as a place in which people are free to speak the truth. Steve was, as you can see, the kind of student we all dream of, the student who summons us to do our best. And what I really want to say here, both as a spokesperson for the university and as a former teacher and a friend, is simply that we're proud of you, Steve. Proud of you not simply because of your success out in the world, but because you so obviously love to dream those terrible and wonderful dreams, and because you are willing to share those dreams with us. And we're proud of you because, rather than repeating the same formulas in your successive books, you have constantly sought out new ways of challenging our imaginations, as in the just published companion novels, Desperation and the Regulators, which open up a dazzling dialectic between West and East, the frontier and the suburbs, the myths of the Old West, and the myths of the mass, mass media. We're also proud of you because of the ways you've used your extraordinary talents to remind us, and especially young people, that there really are monsters out there, but that we can overcome them if we can create among ourselves sufficiently powerful bonds of love and trust. In particular, we're proud of the way you, acculturated like all of us into a crippling conception of masculinity, have struggled to project your imaginations of the lives of women, thereby helping other men to understand what it might be, mean to be a woman. Not least, we're proud of the fact that you have chosen to live, live among us, and we're grateful for the generosity you have shown toward the people of this region. So thank you, Steve, and welcome back. Your check will be in the mail. <clears throat> it's funny, Bert's got all these memories of, of me, but uh, I have a lot of memories of him as well. Bert, at that time, we talked different then. You know, we said things like groovy with a straight face. And <laughs> Bert was known as a real head. Say, who have you got for English? Got Bert Hatland. Oh, he's a real head. <laughs> and uh, what I remember best, uh, you know, other than the fact that uh, uh, Bert Hatland was one of those guys who taught you that you didn't just go to school to get a job. You know, you went to school to go to school, to learn stuff. Was, uh, in um, <clears throat> the winter of 1970, January, my wife claims it's always 10 degrees colder here uh, at the university than in any of the surrounding areas because it's more or less on an island. There are two rivers. And uh, it was about 12 degrees below zero. And uh, I came out of the university bookstore in this very building and uh, started to walk. And my feet went right out from under me. And I came down on my ass. And Bert at that time had this little sob, a little red funky sob, and he just went by and flipped me the peace sign like that. <laughs> he kept on going. <laughs> they were great days. Uh, I'm flattered that you, that you came to this. Uh, there are people out there who actually ate airline food to, to get here. <laughs> Some three times in the course of one day, they ate airline food. So I'm very flattered that you came, and I, I want to thank you for that. Um, I'm going to entertain some questions afterward, if you have any. But the question that I'm asked uh, most frequently is, what about the new Dark Tower book? Uh, <laughs> I'm writing it now. Um, 
At first, I thought it would be extremely short. Um, the train crashed and they all died. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> somehow I didn't think that would go over too well, so I now have uh, a manuscript that's about 1,400 pages long. Uh, the book is now longer than anything I've ever written in, in my sad, short life. And uh, I brought a piece of it tonight, and if you want to hear a little bit of it, I will I'll read a little bit. Um, and I hope that uh, while you're here over the weekend, if the weather's nice and it's supposed to be, that you'll get a, a look at uh, my hometown, Bangor. The uh, Chamber of Commerce pays me to say that, so. Um, <laughs> You'll see a lot of little bits of, of dairy. For all I know, they've set up a tour, you know, a sort of it tour as a part of this. But the standpipe is there, the one that rolls down the hill and it. It hasn't rolled down the hill yet. If it does, considering where I live, I'm in trouble. Um, the library is there, and it's pretty much the library in, in it. Uh, you will see a statue of Paul Bunyan. It is one of the most exquisitely ugly statues. <laughs> Oh, some of you have been there. You've seen it. You've seen it. <laughs> well, then you know, don't you? And uh, it hasn't actually come down and chased anybody through the streets yet, but uh, I can imagine it uh, actually happening. Um, there's also a canal running through town, and uh, it's pretty much the, the canal that was in the book. Although, actually, I had the idea for it in uh, Colorado. I had an American Motors uh, Matador, which one day dropped its transmission and right in the middle of Pearl Street. And while I was in the process of walking home, I crossed this little bridge and I had on a pair of cowboy boots and it made this sort of hollow clop, clop, clop sound. And I thought of uh, a story that I'd, I'd read or had read to me when I was a kid, the three billy goats gruff and a troll under the bridge saying, who is that trip trapping on my bridge? And I thought, oh, have I got an idea for a story? And uh, you'll also see, if you happen to go down there and you go in the right area, a place that used to be Dakin Sporting Goods, which was the site of the Brady Gang shootout in the, uh, in the 30s. And you know, when I got ready to write it, I got uh, interested in two things. I got interested in what happened, but I really wasn't as interested in what happened as what people thought happened, you know? Um, and one of the things that people told me was these people were gunned down like rats in front of the store and the bullet holes were still there in the facade. And if you go there and look at this building, you will see the bullet holes are still there. Unless you look very closely and you realize they're really like where they put screws to hold the sign up. <laughs> but I believe what the John Ford put in that Western of his, you know, when it comes down to a choice between truth and legend, print the legend, which is what I did. And you'll see plenty of uh, sewers, some equipped with balloons. Uh, but Bangor is an easy town to see. If you ask what the best restaurant is, the answer is none. <clears throat> there's none really, no really bad ones, but there's no really great ones either. Uh, objects of interest, there are a number of massage parlors. Um, <laughs> There's the Bounty Tavern, and uh, there's, there's my house. Uh, I remember one day, I, I wasn't really hip to all the people that would come and take pictures. I mean, you're sort of aware of them in the back of your mind until one day I'm out uh, walking the dog. We call it walking the dog, but what we're actually giving the dog a chance to do is to do his business. My brother David, <clears throat> who now lives in New Hampshire, which is what he deserves. <laughs> this, is, this is one of the most, well, I mean, New Hampshire stands for all the fine things in life, don't they? Lottery tickets, cheap booze, cheap cigarettes. It's a wonderful place. Six Gun City, Santa's Village. <laughs> Why, it's heaven for Republicans. <laughs> Anyway, my brother says he's going to take the dog out to do tricks. <laughs> Sometimes his dog does tricks inside the house, as far as that goes. But anyway, one day I had 
Marlo out doing tricks and hear this click, 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 click sound and turn around and there's a tour bus out front and there's like 50 people lined up along my fence taking pictures of my dog taking a dump. <laughs> so that's, that's celebrity life in Bangor, folks. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I tend to speak off the cuff when I don't have to say anything in particular, and if I do, I write stuff down, which is what I, what I did this evening. Um, it seems to me that there are some very clear issues related to, but not exactly centering on my work that are floating across this conference, sort of like uh, ghosts in a, real ghosts in, in the parlor of an amusement park haunted house. Uh, one is the issue of censorship, another is the issue of teaching popular adult fiction in schools, and a third is using high motivational materials to teach reading disadvantaged children. Now, Bert pointed out that I, was a, I attended the College of Education here, and high motivational materials to teach reading disadvantaged children, this is the way you say it. You have to say it. It's like in your contract if you've been to the College of Education. Most people express this concept by saying teaching kids to read by giving them books they really like. Um, because I tend to approach what ideas I have through stories rather than by reasoning, let me begin by two which may or may not be related to these questions, and I'm certainly not going to try to torture them into a part of what I have to say. All I can say is they're the stories that occurred to me when I thought about what I might say tonight. One has to do with the first time that I went on a, uh, uh, first time I was ever sent on a book tour. Doubleday sent me on a tour with The Shining to uh, seven wonderful cities and seven wonderful days. And I tell sometimes a story about something that happened to me in Pittsburgh about the first time I was asked for an autograph. I won't tell you that story tonight. But uh, they also sent me to Houston. And when I was down there, I was signing books. And of course, I was there for The Shining, but the book before that was Salem's Lot. And there was a young man uh, who came up to me who said, you know, I really love that Salem's Lot. You ought to write a squeal in that Jenner. And I thought about this a little bit. I mean, it was like one of these, <laughs> it was like one of these Zen things, like the sound of one hand clapping, you know? And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm gonna figure this out or I won't sleep for a week. <laughs> you ought to write a squeal in that Jenner. Well, Eventually, you know, the way that these things always happen is they click all at once. I realized he was saying you ought to write a sequel in that genre. <laughs> and I, I chuckled to myself, remembering, you know, things like uh, pronouncing coyote as coyote, which I just, <laughs> I don't know, I just thought they were coyotes. Jack ran as fast as he could, but he could not outrun the ravening coyotes. <laughs> Because I read to myself, and uh, there was nobody to help me with that particular word, and so I pronounced it the way that I pronounced it. Probably you have words that you feel the same way about. But uh, So I chuckled, and then a little while later, I realized something that struck me as maybe not so funny, but interesting in a way, that here was a young man who had mentioned his brothers and sisters, who came from a large family, and I realized that if he was pronouncing those words that way, it was because he was the only person in the family who did read. And indeed, he did come from that sort of rough-hewn family where he had discovered the books and uh, nobody else in the family read. And he, I remember him saying that he related very strongly to the works of Robert Howard, who created the character Conan, the barbarian, because Howard had come from a town in Texas that was similar to the one where this kid grew up. And again, Robert Howard was a kid who read was the only person he knew who did, the only person who di discovered it. And I also remember being a few years later, around the time of the, uh, I guess around the time of Dark Half maybe. I know that the subject in mind, I was at American Library Association convention and a representative from one of these companies that publishes books primarily for a juvenile market came up to me and said, you know, you have a great range of titles here. And one of the things that I'd like to speak to you very seriously about 
is the thought of publishing a student edition of Firestarter. And I said, well, why would you need to publish a student edition of Firestarter? Kids are reading it. And he said, well, we could go through it and, and we would consult with you completely, but there are a number of questionable words and there's some passages and this and that and the other thing. And we could take these out and not hurt the story. And a lot of kids who find this high motivational material would read the book. They'd get it in the school and library. Maybe they could teach it. I said, oh, that sounds like a great idea. I'll think about that. So I did the speech to the American librarians, and afterwards it was a cocktail party, and we were talking about this, and there were several librarians there, young women who were very dedicated and very interested and loved books and wanted to talk about my stuff. And I mentioned this, and one of these librarians, like, turned white. And she, like, turned right around and started away from me. You know, and I mean, she was marching. I mean, she was, she was pissed, oh, <laughs> smoking, you know? So I grab her and I say, what's the matter? She says, I put my job on the line to keep that book in the library the way that you wrote it. And you tell me that this guy comes up and says he wants to expurgate it, and you're taking him seriously. And I said, oh, I never thought about it that way. And then I did start to think about it. I started to think about it a lot, and I'm still thinking about it, and I know that a lot of you that are here tonight are thinking about it. I'll leave it at that, and uh, you can fit it in here where it goes, if it goes. But I've never forgotten it. Readable, interesting novels don't begin with a desire to teach, but with a desire to please. The writer of such books isn't always successful because of any particular skill, but because his loves, obsessions, and objects of fascination overlap the loves, obsessions, and fascinations of his readers. This may happen for a writer many times, as has been the case with writers as disparate as Robert Ludlum, Danielle Steele, V.C. Andrews, who continues to publish successful novels even though she's dead. <laughs> One of my favorite moments in a V.C. Andrews novel. I'm never going to get through this tonight, you know. I'm just going to keep digressing, but... At the beginning, this is the story of the Dollenganger children. Raise your hands out there if you've read the story of the Dollenganger children. Don't be afraid. <laughs> Get them up there. The whole thing starts when the children's daddy is killed while he's on his way home, hurrying home from business to attend the birthday party of, I think it's the twins. And instead of daddy, a state trooper appears at the door when the party's getting ready to start. When the door opens, the children are all gathered around, and the trooper holds out this blood-stained teddy bear and says, this is what happens when you don't drive defensively. <laughs> God, that was touching. Anyway, sometimes this overlap only happens once, really, as in the case of William Peter Blatty's The Exorcist or Robert James Waller's The Bridges of Madison County. One of the most interesting things I ever heard about Waller, who has sold his own CDs on cable TV and has a remarkably tiny head for a man of letters. <laughs> if you ever seen him, he's got this little small, I mean, it's a good looking head, but it is real small. A lot of silver hair, but little head. Is that every book he has written since Bridges expresses this weird inverse ratio. Each is better written and sells less copies. The last barely kissed the bestseller list. I have been fortunate enough in my career to have written a number of, uh, to have struck a number of those chords in my readers, points where my perception of the world seems to overlap their own, thus offering up that shock of recognition that sometimes only a book can provide. I can still remember my first intimate acquaintance with that shock, sitting in the second floor lounge of Gannett Hall here at the University of Maine, on sleety winter nights reading the early novels of Ross MacDonald and finding in them over and over again observations and insights which exactly expressed my own thinking, but which were set out in a way more elegant than any I could have imagined. Those books made me feel elevated. They made me feel glad to be alive. That is something I always wanted to pass on as a writer. And in some cases I have, but mostly not because of any extraordinary ability on my own part. I've become, 
I've become wealthy and well-known to a very real extent because I happen to be an average American of my time with some narrative ability and some visualization skills. To be well paid for what I do is great. To be honestly enjoyed by so many readers is even greater. Nor is that false modesty. The desire to please or try to is more or less hardwired into my system to the extent that when I was a small child, my mother sometimes used to say, Stevie, if you were a girl, you would always be pregnant. <laughs> the way... <clears throat> She had a lot of those. <laughs> she had a lot of those. You'd ask her for something for a store and she'd say, you need that like a hen needs a flag. <laughs> you used to go, like a hen needs a what? <laughs> you know, and it didn't make any sense, but it shut you up, you know? <laughs> she'd say, people have more fun than anyone except horses and they can't. So the surprise isn't my brother went to New Hampshire. The surprise is that I stayed in Maine. <laughs> anyway, this, uh, this, uh, the way I have tried to repay this good life and fulfilling career is to give as completely as I can of what I have and to entertain people as well as I can and to try and play the game squarely. The best thing I ever read on that subject was attributed to Frank Norris, author of McTeague, The Octopus and the Pit. Responding to critical indignation over the rough and often squalid lives depicted in his fiction, Norris said, What do I care what they think of my work or how they rate it? I never truckled. I told the truth. I would be perfectly happy to have that last part. I never truckled. I told the truth on my tombstone. I may have told a few whoppers about ghosts, goblins, vampires, and the living dead, but I like to think I've told the truth as best I've been able to manage it, about the human beings. And I also like to think that it's the human beings that my books are mostly about. As for the more outre subject matter, there's something that Ben Mears says in Salem's Lot that I've always liked. The whole world is coming down around our ears. Why stick at a few vampires? I write each book twice. The first time, when it comes out of my head and onto the page, what I'm mostly concerned about is the emotional gradient. That writer has absolutely zippo interest in theme, allegory, symbolism, politics, ethics, sexual roles, culture, or dramatic unity. What I want is to reach through the paper and grab the reader. I don't want to just mess with your head. I want to mess with your life. I want you to miss appointments, burn dinner, skip your homework. <laughs> I want you to tell your wife to take that moonlight stroll on the beach at Waikiki with the resort's tennis pro. <laughs> while you read a few more chapters and see if Jesse Burlingame is going to get out of the handcuffs or if Gage Creed is going to come back from the dead and eat his mother. I want you afraid to turn off the lights. I want you sorry you ever started the goddamn thing in the first place. <laughs> and I still don't want you able to stop. With me, that first time through, it's personal, and it's really more about you than it is about me. I want you sweating bullets and looking behind doors, and nothing about this seems in the least abnormal to me, I'm afraid. <laughs> Compulsive reading is a sickness, and I've always wanted to be typhoid Stevie. <laughs> but there can be more to a book. I don't say that there has to be more. There's room for Clive Cussler in my philosophy as long as I don't have to read him. <laughs> only that there can be more. I, I do know that a book which lives only on an emotional spectrum is a disposable item, the mental equivalent of a stick of gum. I found out early on that there can be a second and more resonant level in popular fiction. This came to me in the writing of Carrie when I realized that the book was in addition to a story about a sad little girl with psychokinetic powers, a story about blood and what blood means to us, an actual substance, it also provides powerful metaphoric connections to such things as religion, washed in the blood of the lamb, and adulthood, which for girls is symbolized in part by first menstruation. Blood also symbolizes powerful family connections, which we sometimes hate and find we still can't ditch. 
The blood imagery in Carrie doesn't make it a great book. As I pointed out somewhere with my usual customary delicacy, you can frost a dog turd and it's still a dog turd. <laughs> I'm not saying that Carrie is shit and I'm not repudiating it. <laughs> she made me a star. But it was a young book by a young writer. In retrospect, it reminds me of a cookie baked by a first grader. <laughs> Tasty enough, but kind of lumpy and burned on the bottom. <laughs> but the vibrations of that blood imagery still pleases me, and so I believe it gives the book what echo it has. So ever since Carrie, when I worked purely by instinct and achieved what little I did mostly by accident, I have written for emotion and rewritten for something else, something that's harder to name without sounding either too pompous or too humble. I guess you could say that whole body rewrite comes in an effort to satisfy my own intellectual curiosity because, dig, if every book has to be about something and if the writer did an honest job, he didn't truckle in Frank Norris's terminology, then the result is to be bound to be something that the writer cares about. And if the writer works very fast, as I do on first draft, there are apt to be some interesting connections which form almost on their own, the way, the way snowflakes form. With Salem's Lot, it was the connection between small town life, as I understood it growing up, and the whole idea of vampirism. With The Shining, it was the connection between alcohol abuse and child abuse. It was also the idea that while hotels may or may not be haunted in the off season, human lives are almost always haunted by the lives of others. When I wrote The Shining the first time, the wasp's nest that Jack finds in the roof, um, the one where the wasps come back to life and sting his son in the middle of the night, that was there strictly as something that intensified the suspense, that made the tale telling more personal and vital between me and the person that I call constant reader. Later on, thinking about what I'd written in a cooler frame of mind, it struck me that the wasps served as an adequate symbol for the pass it on nature of abuse. What we are able to live with as adults, what doesn't sting us as the wasps in the nest won't sting Jack after they've stung his son, will sometimes sting our loved ones as we ourselves were stung when we were younger. And the nest that comes back to life when it's supposed to be dead also expressed the nature of the overlook to me. And it seemed to me too that it was a viable way of expressing what, what I felt emotionally about, about ghosts and what ghosts are if they are. It's this second level, the one where the Tommyknockers is a book about technological abilities which have far outraced moral ones, the one where Pet Cemetery is a book about the corruption of love, or the one where Misery is a book about the redemptive and liberating qualities of imagination, that is the level most commonly taught in schools because that level can be taught. That the teaching is in many ways irrelevant is, is an ironic counterpoint. You can teach the lyrics to a Bruce Springsteen song like Atlantic City in a high school poetry class with some success because it's a song of ideas, but that still ignores the fact that Atlantic City has this absolutely bitchin' E minor G, C chord progression. Um, songs are about how you feel in the dark, not what some teacher says while standing in front of a blackboard. And some stories are like that too. I write twice because I want to know what I think as well as I feel, but I write to begin with because my heart demands it and would break without it. So I can stand here and say that it has a coherent thematic core. You cannot be an adult in this or any society until you have finished with your childhood, and one most commonly does this by raising children of one's own. But there is nothing thematic about the way the book feels to me like the body, it is about what I remember most and treasure best in my own childhood. Love and terror and finding a hand to hold when things get hard and living in the world hurts. I think that young people who don't ordinarily read, like my friend in Houston who wanted to squeal in that Jenner, are attracted by that combination of emotional heat and honest, if sometimes simplistic, intellectual investigation. I think that even those who wouldn't know a thematic unity if it bit them on the ass sense that books are better when they are about something and best of all when the something they are about pertains to their own lives. Often those who come new to the idea of reading for pleasure become the most heartstruck fans and partisans because the power of fiction catches them by surprise and just knocks them over. It's like healed Jesus, bang, <laughs> and they go in the water.
and I love it. I love it. In some cases, of course, my readers are R.L. Stein fans who have recently gotten past the point where they believe, A, that snapping a girl's bra strap is suavely romantic. <laughs> B, that a loud fart in study hall is the most hilarious occurrence <laughs> imaginable. And C, that no rock group can express the angst of the modern junior high schooler as well as Pantera or Metallica. In others, I like to think that they manage to skip the Stein experience, Deep Woods mummies, vampire football coaches, and all entirely. I have nothing against R.L. Stein, but I put him with Clive Cussler. Let him write forever, as long as I don't have to read him. <laughs> the two of us are all often paired by school teachers and school librarians, however. We are two examples of that fabled creature, the must-read writer. School librarians love us because we move. <laughs> the Vinabine Company loves us because damn near every paperback edition of our stuff must undergo the process or fall apart. English teachers love us a little less. I'm sure there are many English teachers in this great land of ours who feel they will kill themselves if they have to read another book report <laughs> on Firestarter or Christine. Still, they tell themselves, and they often tell me as well, at least they're reading. At least they're reading. I have very little sympathy with this attitude, in fact. If the main goal is getting the kids to read anything, never mind the good stuff like of Mice and Men, Pride and Prejudice, or Macbeth, why not hand out Soldier of Fortune magazine, or Cosmopolitan, or teach grammatical construction with examples from the Penthouse Forum? If just getting them to read is the goal, those materials might serve even better than Bridges of Madison County or The Horse Whisperer, a book about which I may paraphrase Oscar Wilde and say, it is impossible to finish without weeping copious tears of laughter. <laughs> a few cars further along on this same train of thought is the idea that Reading Stephen King is somehow going to encourage kids who have never read before to try a little George Eliot or William Faulkner. Please. <laughs> you know, give me a break. I just can't imagine a kid who has enjoyed The Running Man or The Long Walk moving eagerly along to The Merchant of Venice or Mill on the Floss. Mm. No more could I imagine someone saying, if I like the meatloaf, I will undoubtedly enjoy the stewed rutabagas. <laughs> Just because a group of kids may be slower at reading than their peers, they're not dumb. Nor am I comfortable with the idea of being a poster boy for the pleasures of reading, or the carnival barker outside the big tent telling people to hurry, hurry, hurry. If they like what they read on the outside, they're going to love what they read on the inside. Um, I do what I can as well as I can, and if my work has led some new readers on to the works of others, or launched them on lives where the TV stands off for whole nights at the, where the TV stays off for whole nights at a stretch, I'm very pleased. But I don't want to be the ramp that kids tromp over from the dirty docklands of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys to the great ship of literature where Dorothy Parker and Norman Mailer are holding court in first class. I just want to be me. And to tell you the truth, I feel happiest when I see some kid reading one of my books, not in the classroom, but sitting on a school bus headed to an away soccer game, or flopped out on a beach somewhere during summer vacation. I dutifully glance at the term papers on my work kids sometimes send me, but the stories I really like are the ones about people who strike up friendships or even fall in love because they shared an interest in Stuart Redman or Dolores Claiborne or stuttering Bill Denbro. I think that books can survive in the classroom environment for a while, but if they're kept there and only there for too long, they end up as dead as the fetal pigs in biology too. <clears throat> Nor do I want to be a poster boy for fighting censorship in the schools or be pals with the groups who see it as an issue of overriding importance. I saw Judy Bloom first espoused by such groups, then co-opted by them, and last of all, all, and at last, all but eaten alive by them. I'm not making a point about censorship here, if you dig. I'm making a point about Judy Bloom. 
Her job isn't trying to convince people who can't be convinced that children should be allowed to read at the level of their comprehension. Her job is to go on writing books like, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, The Kids Love and Treasure. Remember, each writer is a one-of-a-kind creature, and sooner or later we all fall off the shelf and break, like the vase you liked so much and cried over because not all the king's horses and all the king's men could ever put it back together again. I remember very clearly my, my uh, mother's sister, my Aunt Molly, crying when she heard that Kenneth Roberts had died because there'd never be another Oliver Wiswell or Boone Island or Arundo. To ask a Judy Bloom <coughs> or a Stephen King or even an R.L. Stein or Clive Cussler to spend his or her 30 or 40 years of creative life not only writing books but defending them is unfair and practical and it seems to me a little bit absurd. Don't get me wrong, I have little or no use for censorship. I've done some PSAs on TV defending the fundamental right to read. I've given money to defeat referenda aimed at restricting the free flow of information. And if you put a V-chip on my TV remote control, you'll do it only when you pry it from my cold, dead fingers. I can tell you that. <laughs> I have a problem with people who want to take the catcher in the rye or bastard out of Carolina out of the high schools and keep the shotguns in Walmart. <laughs> just, just as I... <clears throat> just as I have a problem with legislators who at the same time want to outlaw abortions and federal assistance programs aimed at helping single mothers. This attitude seems to me to be like it's wrong to vacuum them or drown them in saline, but it's okay to starve them once they're outnamed and baptized. I have the same... Well, I see the conservatives left early. <laughs> I have the same problem with politicians who inveigh constantly, endlessly against drugs such as pot and heroin but continue to support business interests which spend millions to teach our kids what fun it is to freebase nicotine. Um, I can't think about these things too long. I go nuts. I hulk out. And one thing that's absolutely true is the, the, you know, the toast always lands butter side down and the hulk don't write. So, <laughs> People who want certain books out of schools or out of the libraries will tell you that they want to protect their children from certain ideas, certain words, and certain views of American life and the human condition, which they find inappropriate. The fact that they are denying these things to all the other kids around their own, well, they'll say, that's just too bad. Tough titty, said the kitty, but the milk's not warm. Push them a little further and they'll invoke family values, a phrase that more and more frequently makes me feel like falling to the floor and projectile vomiting. <laughs> Censorship and the suppression of reading materials is rarely about family values and almost always about control. Who is snapping the whip? Who is saying no? And who is saying go? Censorship's bottom line is this. If the novel Christine offends me, I don't want to just make sure it's kept from my kid. I want to make sure it's kept from your kid as well. And all the kids. This bit of intellectual arrogance, undemocratic and as old as time, is best expressed this way. If it's bad for me and my family, it's bad for everyone's family. Yet when books are run out of school classrooms and even out of school libraries as a result of this idea, I'm never much disturbed. Not as a citizen, not as a writer, not even as a school teacher, which I was trained to be and used to do. What I tell the kids is don't get mad, get even. Don't spend time waving signs or carrying petitions around the neighborhood. Instead, run, don't walk to the nearest non-school library or to the local bookstore and get whatever it was they banned. Read what they're trying to keep out of your eyes. Read what they're trying to keep out of your brain, because that's exactly what you need to know. Schools, supported by tax dollars and charged with caring for increasingly diverse student bodies in increasingly difficult and argumentative times, have a difficult responsibility when it comes to the issue of what books to teach in the classroom and what books to keep out. Parents have an equally difficult but less frequently articulated responsibility, which sometimes comes down to the decision to sit down and shut up. Easy to say, but often difficult, terribly difficult to do. Sometimes, you know, it's just best to let the kid read the book 
and trust him to evaluate it sensibly. In other words, trust those family values, the real working article instead of some vague concept invoked by politicians. When parents feel they must speak out against a book that's being taught or kept in a school library, there should be a review procedure that can be used in a sane fashion. I believe that those who object to certain books should be given a fair hearing, but that they should have to work just as hard to explain what's wrong with a novel or a story as the teacher does to explain in the classroom what's right with it. No fair just coming in with 23 cuss words and one sex scene marked out in yellow highlighter, which is what they always do. The objecting parent or citizen ought to be able to explain in some rational way why he or she feels the book has no redeeming um, social or intellectual merit. If he or she can, that's fine. If he or she can't, which is usually the case, in my experience, give them a choice. Either give the, book, the, the kid the book to read and also discuss it with him at home, giving him your own perspective or her, or yank him or her the hell out and go the homeschooling route. But appeal should always come from parents. Appeal should always come from parents. Under no circumstances do I think that pressure groups, religious pressure groups, pressure groups like the moral majority, should be allowed to come in and clog up the teaching process with a lot of their tiresome agendas. Most of these folks should be consigned to Jim, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker's gold-plated doghouse. <laughs> the rule of law which covers all this, disliked by all too many Americans and hated by some, goes like this. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. In other words, get your damn hands off what I'm reading, my friend, and keep your family values in your own family. I like as many of my books as possible to find their places in school libraries. If nothing else, they pass the time in boring study halls and activity periods. But as long as they're available in the town library or in the paperback at the same Walmart where they do sell shotguns and don't sell the new Sheryl Crow album, um, <clears throat> then, then I'm reasonably happy. The best thing for me and the most dismaying thing for the would-be censors is that kids have minds of their own and are engaged in learning how to use them. If you tell them Stephen King is good for them, they will read me. If you tell them I'm bad for them, that I'll warp their little minds, they will stampede to read me. <laughs> as long, that is, as the stuff is there. As long as we don't reach the point where folks are piling so-called subversive books in the street, dousing them with gasoline and setting them on fire. This is Family Values circa Berlin, 1938. And I think radical right and religious militants notwithstanding, we are still quite a long way from that. I hope I've spoken to at least some of the themes of this brief conference and that I've given you a few things to think about. I expect I've said some things with at least well, with which at least a few of you disagree, and I hope that you will argue about those things later on tonight. <laughs> Most importantly, I want to remember, remind you of one thing. Check under your bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you think that's funny now. <laughs> because we're all here. <laughs> the lights are on. And then the night you get in bed and say, oh, shit. <laughs> I never check. You want to check on the closet as well, all right? <laughs> and I would check the back seat of your car, actually. <laughs> before you got in, and a look in the trunk wouldn't hurt. It only takes a second. And uh, I want you to uh, remember, too, that statistics show that at every college conference, there is at least one dangerous lunatic. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have some questions for me? I'm sorry? 
Oh, you want me to read from, the, well, all right, I will in a little bit. <laughs> this won't take long because it isn't a very long section and I have no real idea of what it says <laughs> because I'm in that first phase where I'm running mostly to feel whatever is in my emotions and later on if I ever get this thing done, I will uh, I'll read it um, over and see if I can figure out what I was thinking about as well as what I was feeling. Uh, I can tell you that most of this book takes place uh, a long time ago in, in Roland the Gunslinger's past. In fact, most of it takes place when Roland is 14 years old. And uh, it takes place at a time which in Roland's strange world is called <clears throat> fin de año. So this is called closing the year. So now comes to May his fin de año, known in toward the center of midworld as closing the year. It comes as it has come a thousand times before, or perhaps 10,000 or 100,000. No one can tell for sure. The world has moved on and time has grown strange. In Mahis, no one cares. Their saying is, time is a face on the water. In the fields, the last of the potatoes are now being picked by men and women who wear gloves in their heaviest serapes. For now the wind is turned firmly, blowing east to west, blowing hard, and always there's the smell of salt in the chilly air, a smell like tears. Los Campesinos harvest the final rows cheerfully enough, talking of things they'll do and capers they'll cut at reaping fair, but they all feel autumn's old sadness in the wind, the going of the year. It runs away from them like water in a stream, and although none speak of it, all know it. They know it very well. In the orchards, the last of the apples are picked by laughing young men. In these not-quite gales, the final days of picking belong only to them, who bob up and down like crow's nest lookouts. Above them, in skies which hold a brilliant and cloudless blue, squadrons of geese fly south, calling their adieu in rusty voices. The small fishing boats are pulled from the water. Their hulls are scraped and painted by singing owners, who mostly work stripped to the waist in spite of the chill in the air. They sing the old songs as they work. I am a man of the bright blue sea, all I see, all I see. I am a man of the barony, all I see is mine, oh. I am a man of the bright blue bay, all I say, all I say. Until my nets are full, I stay, all I say is fine, oh. And sometimes a little cask of graft, the strong apple beer, is tossed from dock to dock and hand to hand. On the bay itself, only the large boats now remain, pacing about the big circles which mark their drop nets as a working dog may pace the perimeter of a flock of sheep. At noon, the bay is a rippling sheet of autumn fire, and the men on the boats sit cross-legged, eating their lunches, and know that all they see is theirs, oh, at least until the great gales of autumn come swarming over the horizon, coughing out their gusts of sleet and snow. Closing, we are closing the year. Along the streets of Hambry, the reap lights now burn and flicker at night, and the hands of the stuffy guys are painted red. Reap charms hang everywhere, and although women often kiss and are kissed in the streets and in both marketplaces, often by men they do not know, sexual intercourse has come to an almost complete halt. It will resume, resume with a bang, you might say, on reap night. There will be the usual crop of full earth babies the following year as a result. On the drop, the horses gallop wildly as if understanding, very likely they do, that their time of unrestrained freedom is coming to an end. They swoop and then stand with their faces pointing west when the wind gusts, showing their asses to winter. On the ranches, porch screens are taken down and shutters are rehung. In the huge ranch kitchens, in the huge ranch kitchens and smaller farmhouse kitchens, no one is stealing reap kisses and no one is even thinking about sex. This is the time of putting up and laying by and the kitchens fume with steam and pulse with heat from before dawn until long after dark. There is the smell of apples and beets and beans and sharp root and curing strips of meat. Women work ceaselessly all day and then sleepwalk to bed, where they lie like corpses until the next dark morning calls them back to their kitchens.
Leaves are burned in town yards, and as the week goes on, and old Demon Moon's face shows more and more clearly, red-handed stuffy guys are thrown on the pyres more and more frequently. In the fields, corn shocks flare like torches, and often stuffy guys burn with them, their red hands and white cross eyes rippling in the heat. Men stand around these fires, not speaking, their faces solemn. No one will say what terrible old ways and unspeakable old gods are being propitiated by the burning of the guys, but they all know well enough. They know they are closing, closing the year. The streets rattle with firecrackers and sometimes with a heftier big bang that makes even the placid cot horses rear in their traces and echo with the laughter of children. On the porch of the mercantile and across the street at the traveler's rest, kisses, sometimes humanly open and with much sweet lashing of tongues, are exchanged. But Coral Thorin's whores, cotton gillies is what the airy fairy ones like Gert Moggins like to call themselves, are sulky and bored. They will have little custom this week. This is not year's end when the winter logs will burn and mayhus will be barn dances from one end to the other. And yet it is. This is the real year's end. And everyone, from Stanley Ruiz standing at the bar beneath the romp to the loneliness of Fran Lengel's vaqueros out on the edge of the bad grass, knows it. There is a kind of echo in the bright air, a yearning for other places in the blood, a loneliness in the heart that sings like the wind. But this year there is something else as well a kind of unspoken wrongness that no one can quite voice, a sense of something with teeth slouching this way. Folks who never had a nightmare in their lives will awake screaming with them during this week of fin de año. Men who consider themselves peaceful will find themselves not only in fistfights, but instigating them. Discontented boys who would only have dreamed of running away in other years will this year actually do it, and most will not come back after the first night spent sleeping rough. There is a sense, inarticulate but very much there, that things have gone amiss in this season. It is the closing of the year. It is also the closing of the peace. For it is here, in the sleepy outworld barony of Mahis, that Midworld's last great conflict will shortly begin. It is from here that the blood will begin to flow. In two years, no more, the world as Roland had always known it would be swept away. It starts here, from its field of roses, the dark tower cries out in its beast's voice. Time is a face on the water. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I ain't done with you yet, chummy. Do any of you have questions? We've got about 15 minutes. Yes, down in the front row. Yeah, he asked uh, if I was a novelist just beginning today, what would I do differently? Considering the way it's turned out for me, not a goddamn thing. <laughs> Anybody else got a question? <laughs> no. Well, speak up if you do. Oh, she asked, was I going to do another series like The Green Mile? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't think I'd want to go back to that well again. Um, I think there's a little bit of lift left in that particular beast, and I, I was delighted with the response to the story. Um, there's a writer named John Saul who's going to try it. He's going to start uh, a series called The Blackstone Chronicles in, um, what's this, October? I'm sorry, the Alzheimer's kicking in. <laughs> um, he's going to start, I think, in February with a six-part thing, so we'll see how it works out. Uh, I think John Song is an okay writer, and I, I hope that it turns out well for him. But the one thing is you publish a novel, and the critics get to kick your ass once. When you do a novel in six part, they get to kick your ass six times, uh, which is a pain in the ass. But I, I just want to say, too, the other thing, the other reason that I don't think I would want to do it is that uh, the best that... Um, 
Signet could do in terms of delivery of that number of qualities. After a while, once you reach a certain number of copies, it, you become this lumbering dinosaur in terms of getting out to the marketplace. So they sold those books at $2.99 a pop and $3.99 for the last one, and I think the running total was $18.94. Given six paperbacks, I was uncomfortable about the price total. And I told myself all through it, well, if this were a hardcover, if the Green Mile were a hardcover, you'd pay 24 bucks for it. So it's a total saving, but it never quite, you know, rang totally true. So somebody over here, yes, sir. Right. Right. <laughs> Mr. King, when did you stop beating your wife? <laughs> Communism, threat or menace? He asked if I wrote myself into a corner with the, uh, the stand when the hand of God comes down out of the sky. I did and I didn't. I felt again, toward the end, as though that were the place where the, where the book was headed. Uh, the Stand is interesting in the sense that it starts out as a science fiction novel and becomes fantasy novel and ends up being sort of a theological novel. But I did feel like God was sort of a late arrival in, <laughs> in that book. Not a tremendously late arrival, but, you know, the thing is, I just did this book, Desperation, which uh, is a story that's set in, in Nevada, and uh, God is a major character in this book. God's there almost from the beginning because, you know, God gets, God gets bad treatment. God never gets his ups in supernatural novels, modern ones anyway, you know what I'm saying? I mean, God is like kryptonite, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you bring him on and you get the, the guy who says, Speck, in the name of God, and the vampire goes, <laughs> like that, and that's it. And I'm thinking, you know, I started to think, this is really interesting, not so much th that God is treated like kryptonite, but how little God is there at all in these novels, you know, and, and anything that has to do with the supernatural. God is like, you, <laughs> pages and pages go into the lore of the vampire, the lore of the werewolf, and then God just sort of trots on like George Burns, you know, and does a little <laughs> tap dance, and then, then he's gone again, and I thought, well, Let's give God his ups and see what happens. So, Desperation, probably, you know, Desperation is a book where the hand of God is there at the beginning as well as at the end. What happened to Richard Backman? What happened to Richard Backman? Well, I don't know. He died. Cancer of the pseudonym. <laughs> but his wife found a, a whole box of stuff, <laughs> which is how regulators... You know, the thing was, okay, let me tell you, you know, I... I had an idea for a book called The Regulators, and I had this sticky up on my word processor, and I was writing Desperation, and I, I really had this, this good idea, and I was gonna like write it at some point. And one day when I was coming back into my house, this voice speaks up in my mind and says, use all the characters from Desperation and write it right away as soon as you finish this book. And I'm, I'm saying, I can't do that. But, this voice that talks, and it isn't unusual, you know, sometimes people look at me like, oh yeah, voices in your hand, right? Yeah. <laughs> but that's what novelists do. You know, that's what we're supposed to do, is we're supposed to hear these voices in our head. So, you know, it's like when E.F. Hutton talks, I listen. <laughs> so this guy says, no, he says, it's gonna be like a, you know, like a rep company, a couple of productions by the same rep company in theater. I mean, the same cast that does Bus Stop one night does Twelfth Night the next night. And I thought, ooh. That's a really great idea. I said, but the two books will come out sounding just the same. And the voice says, have Bachman do it, right? Bachman is the guy who does the dirty work. He's Stephen King without a conscience. So I say, I can't. Bachman's dead. And this, this guy says, come on. I mean, Jesus Christ, if Paul Sheldon could bring Misery Chastain back to life after she was buried, you can bring Bachman back for another turn. So I said, ah, oh, well, maybe he left some scripts. So that's the skinny on Bachman. Someone over here? Yes, ma'am. Which, which film? Shawshank. Oh, Shawshank Redemption. Well, I like that movie.
But it's, it's a funny thing. It was, let's see, it was last year's number one renter as far as vi video cassettes went. It, was, it topped everything else, but as a movie, it tanked. You know, and nobody went to see it. People didn't go see it in droves. Uh, I tried to make up for it. I went to see it like three times myself. <laughs> and uh, Frank, Frank Darabont is going to make a film out of the Green Mile. So he's the guy who directed Shawshank Redemption. <coughs> he says he is uh, the world's smallest specialist. He only makes Stephen King prison movies. <laughs> <laughs> and I said it's even smaller than that. Stephen King period prison movies. They have to be set in the 30s or 40s. Yeah. Uh, have I ever censored myself or had anything censored? Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, the publisher refused to run with uh, Salem's Lot. There was a scene in Salem's Lot that they demanded that uh, I change because they considered it to be gr too gruesome, and I'm going to tell you what that scene was right now. <laughs> if any of you have read that book, you will remember that there's a scene in the novel where uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the doctor... Uh, tries to go down in, uh, into the basement at Eva Price's rooms and the stairs have been taken away and there are all these knives that have been hammered through boards and he lands on these knives. Do you remember that? I do, vaguely. You know. <laughs> but in the original draft, because it, uh, in Dracula, uh, Dracula's not just a vampire, he's a master of calling these low animals, you know. Uh, Carfax, where he has his place next to the uh, Dr. Seward's asylum, is full of uh, rats and things. So I said, well, okay, now, this is it. The whole basement of Eva Price's rooms is full of rats. But they're all back, sort of like lined up all the way around the room outside where the light is. A way that they could be like in your motel room tonight. <laughs> right? So... In the, in the story, they went down cellar and Ben got away, but Jimmy, the, the Cody, the doctor, did not, and the rats just sort of crawled all over him and kind of like munched him up alive. And Nelson Doubleday said, well, that's not my publishing house. <laughs> what will I say to my friends in East Hampton? <laughs> and so I changed it. I changed it. But have I ever, have I ever censored myself? Of course. Humor and horror are two things where really your fortune or your success is pretty much based on the fact that you'll say anything at any time to anybody. I mean, you just never know when something's going to pop out, you know. So have I ever? Yes, I'm sure that I have. I'm sure. And besides, I mean, we do it all the time. Any writer does it all the time. You look at what you wrote and you say... Uh, you say, uh, that sucks. <laughs> I have to change that because that really sucks. <laughs> it's like, maybe it's a semantical quibble, but you know, if you see you wrote a line, I'm the plumber, he said with a flush, you know. <laughs> you can't, you can't leave that. You can't, you've got to do something about it. You must censor that line out of your script. Uh, yes. Well, I did do The Shining. It's a miniseries. It's done. Um, it's going to be on ABC either this winter or in May uh, with Stephen Weber as Jack Torrance and Rebecca De Mornay as Wendy. And uh, let's see, Elliot Gould plays the hotel manager, Ullman, the officious little prick. <laughs> and uh, Elliot Gould is quite tall. He played the part more as an officious big prick. I thought. And uh, Melvin Van Peebles is Halloran. Um, as far as the Kubrick version goes, two, two people, or t one group and one person, had a say over whether or not we could make the sequel, Warner Brothers and Stanley Kubrick. Warner Brothers agreed, and Stanley Kubrick's one caveat was a, a form that he provided me, or his lawyers provided me, that said I would not say anything more about his version of The Shining. So, <laughs> so no comment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
What's my favorite book of mine? I like them all. <laughs> I don't know. What is my favorite book? Yeah, that'll do. Salem's Law in the Dead Zone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Hey, Mogan. What's up? Oh. <laughs> well, definitely, you know, as a writer of horror stories and as a Boston Red Sox fan, there's a harmonic work in there. You know, there's definitely a harmonic work in there. I, now, now that they've, they've fired Kevin Kennedy, uh, they, never mind this Jeff Torborg business, let's bring back Tollway Joe, Joe Morgan. He did a good job, the Red Sox. That'd be good. How about uh, one or two more? And, and yes, over there. I didn't like the movie. I saw all drafts of the, the screenplay and uh, just sort of passed on him. I thought he did a good job. Yeah. Oh, yes, if I'd ever go on David Letterman again. Nah, probably not. But they asked me to do that. You know, the, the publisher asks you to do a certain number of things. I don't watch them or have anything to do with them afterwards. I used to, uh, I, I was on a great tour one time with, with Jersey Kaczynski, the late J Jersey Kaczynski, who said uh, that he didn't care really which shows he went on because he understood that nobody who read his books watched them anyway, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know. Some of the movies really have bit the... Be well, never mind. I've got to be careful here. The press is probably around somewhere. But, you know, some of them do bite it. That's all. Um, I can't say why. Uh, let's put it this way. The horror genre has a long, dishonorable history of books that are butchered for the screen because basically horror is seen as an exploitation genre and a lot of stuff is done on a fairly low budget and it's done fast. Uh, I remember reading that A. Merritt, the fantasy novelist, wept when he saw the silent version of Seven Footprints to Satan and that's going back 70 years. But you know, I really think the basic thing is the best movie you can make is in your imagination. The monster never has a zipper running up his back and you never, the special effects are always better in your mind. Um, they had, there have been some interesting movies made out of my stuff. I think that, that Cujo was an interesting film. Jan de Bont did the cinematography, who went on and did Speed and, and Twister, neither of which I think are quite as interesting. <laughs> um, Carrie was, was a, a good movie, I thought, and uh, there are some other ones that have been made, I, Dolores Claiborne and, and Misery. I thought Misery was really, you know, pretty good. Um, so they've, they've varied, and w one of the most uh, interesting ones to come along is unreleased yet, and I'm not talking about Thinner. Thinner really, uh, let's put it this way, uh, there are some beautiful exteriors of the Camden area. Beyond, once you get beyond that, you're, you're in a Leicester country, you know. But, uh, but, a young man named Mark Pavia has made a film out of the Night Flyer, uh, starring Miguel Ferrer as the, uh, the uh, tabloid reporter who goes chasing after this vampire with a private pilot's license. And it's an excruciating movie. It's so scary. I mean, uh, I don't know what will happen to it as a, as a, uh, a result of the great Satans that sit on the ratings board. Um, they're the Grinches that stole Halloween, as far as I'm concerned, in a lot of cases. But right now, it's sort of an interesting film. But the fact is, yes, a lot of them are not that good. And I think a lot of it is the, that crucial nine yards between where the movie has to leave off and where your imagination picks up. Could I have maybe one more? In the back. OK, yeah, yeah, you, you. Would I sing for you? Yeah, right. 
You, you couldn't pay enough. If you, if you want to hear me sing, come down to Florida next month. The band's going to play in Miami Beach. I'll sing Teen Angel and all of those things, but I'm not going to sing it here. That's not in my contract. One more? Yeah. Oh, the other scripts that, uh, that Bachman's wife found. Actually, there, there, are a couple of, there are a couple of interesting things in that box, but I haven't really had a chance to investigate them, uh, <laughs> investigate them fully. Now, I want to, <clears throat> I, have, I have a guy that I have to invite up here. Bob, where are you? Right here. Well, come on up. I want to thank you all very much for being so patient. Thank you. And thank you. And enjoy your weekend. Steve, we want to thank you uh, and extend our deepest appreciation to you for uh, participating in this conference and helping us plan it. I'm not going to pay any attention to that, so uh, if you'd like to then take I'll that. just take it. It could, it could actually be. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bob. <laughs> She's doing the work. He's, I'm the dean of education. He's just getting even. That's all. I, I understand that. <clears throat> Um, as a planning group, there are several of us on the steering committee, and actually, uh, that question that came up earlier, would you sing for us, uh, that's really what we had hoped to get Stephen to do, was to come here with his band. But I think we'd all agree it worked out okay to have him come speak. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of the staff, that's, of the student staff working this conference, you can see red t-shirts uh, in the audience and uh, you'll see them a lot more tomorrow. And uh, they have on the front of them, uh, I read banned books. Uh, and Steve has been quoted before as saying he's very proud to be in the company of people who have had their books banned. And, and in fact, we have a t-shirt here that lists some of the banned authors that he's in company with. Um, God, Faulkner, Shakespeare, Walker, Hemingway, Twain, Fitzgerald, Stowe, and Stephen King. There you go. Thank you. You That's bet. beautiful. And just a little twist on the front, which says on the others, uh, I read banned books. On Steve's, we struck the word right, read, and put right. Band books. Thank you. There. Better be an XL or I'm going to be embarrassed. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like it's going to work. Yep. While you're putting that on, Steve, there's another gift. Uh, that <clears throat> another gift that relates to his uh, the advice that he often gives to uh, young authors just starting out or aspiring authors and having to do with uh, the work ethic that it takes to be a writer and uh, we have a um, an embroidery piece here that in Latin says nulla dies mm -hmm. sine linee right. and that never a, never a day never a day without writing a line never right. a day without a line <laughs> now in addition to that on the border of uh, of this frame, 
there, uh, there are the signed names of the steering committee. Now imagine that, the presumptuousness of a group to give Stephen King our autograph. <laughs> David, I want to thank all of you for being here this evening and just to uh, echo the admonition given to you earlier tonight for those of you who are at the dinner. Tomorrow's uh, meeting starts at, uh, well, with uh, coffee and uh, refreshments at 8.30 in the Donald, Donald P. Corbett Business Building, which is right out here, not Cor Corbett Hall. Uh, which is a dormitory. <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, uh, good luck tonight, <laughs> and we hope to see some of you back here tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you very much. In a minute, Kerry Reich talks about his new biography of Nelson Rockefeller.